The time is almost at hand when Ray Comfort and his cronies will make a special bound edition of On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin's opus work, freely available at university campuses in the United States and Canada, complete with his own 50-page introduction. This special intro, now toned down slightly since its original incarnation, still represents, as a whole, a malicious and disingenuous diatribe completely lacking any substance where it matters. You can read the whole publication online right now, using the PDF link in the sidebar, or if you want to read Origin of Species without the preface, you can download it for free in a number of formats from the Project Gutenberg website, also linked in the sidebar. Now, Comfort is entirely within his rights to do this, and any student who made it to university is capable of making up his or her own mind about such matters, so book burning is not the answer here. In the end, I suspect this tactic will have little or no net effect, precisely because of its target audience, who are statistically likely to be more intelligent than Comfort himself. However, it should not go entirely unchallenged. There are many excellent videos online refuting the individual points of the intro in detail. In this video, I'm just going to do a quick and dirty examination of Comfort's stated goal and address the veracity of some of his arguments. This intro has three goals. The first is simply a regurgitation of the Teach the Controversy, or the Strengths and Weaknesses mantra, which is the latest language used by organisations such as the Discovery Institute, who are co-sponsors of this campaign, in their endless attempt to undermine the teaching of godless evolution and to introduce so-called intelligent design into public schools. This in itself is a whole can of worms for comfort, who claims to be a good Christian, since the whole ID movement is really just rebranded creationism, and is about introducing creationism into public schools under the radar, as outlined in the leaked Wedge document, a tactic that is as unconstitutional as it is deceitful. Given Comfort's own stated goal to present a fair and balanced argument, which is demonstrably not the aim of this introduction, his Christian credentials are now looking almost as flaky as his scientific ones. You might want to check that pesky Ninth Commandment, Ray, Exodus 2016, and while you're at it, why not have a read at the First Amendment of the American Constitution? The second goal is to poison the well, or in this case the minds of students, against evolution by natural selection, and bizarrely also against Darwin himself. Interestingly, Comfort quote minds Darwin to promote goal one, and then calls his character into question in goal two. Which is it, Ray? Do we discount everything Darwin said based on his character, or only those things that challenge your dogma? The third goal is purely, and given Comfort's background, predictably, a Christian evangelical one, to convince students that not only does the complexity of life require God, but that this God is the God of the Bible, and that redemption lies in the acceptance of the sacrifice of his only son Jesus, thereby absolving us of our sins, etc. etc. The intro opens with a few quotes which in themselves are factual enough but which are presented here in such a way as to be misleading. Uh, the first by Darwin himself qualifies as a quote now. A fair result can only be obtained by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. Here Darwin was outlining his approach in the introduction to Origin and this statement applies specifically to the arguments he was making therein. As it happens, this approach also applies throughout science when considering individual facts and arguments pertaining to the development of a theory and is to be wholeheartedly endorsed in all fields of inquiry, but this is not what Darwin was referring to here. Suggesting, as Comfort does by including this with the next two quotes, that Darwin is proposing this as a sensible approach in the classroom is clearly ridiculous, as we'll see. The next quote is a statement that formed part of a study by Zogby Group, commissioned by the Discovery Institute, and it reads as follows. Teachers and students should have the academic freedom to discuss both the strengths and weaknesses of evolution as a scientific theory. Comfort points out that 84% of graduates agree with this statement. So what's wrong with this? Well, firstly, the statement assumes there are weaknesses in evolutionary theory. Participants, of which there were just over 1,000, could choose only one of four answers. Strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, or strongly disagree. Given these choices, even I would tick the somewhat agree box, but that is because I realise there are no real weaknesses within the theory of evolution. It's akin to asking, when did you last beat your wife? And providing, as possible answers, very recently, quite recently, quite long ago, or very long ago. 
What's being sought here in the wording of this poll and the publication of its findings is the gradual undermining of trust among the general public that evolution is backed up by real science. You'll note there's no poll of scientists mentioned and the reason is all too obvious. The inclusion of this next quote is simply laughable. Education, you know, means broadening, advancing, and if you limit the teacher to only one side of anything, the whole country will eventually have only one thought, be one individual. I believe in teaching every aspect of every problem or theme. Let's consider the practicalities of what Comfort is trying to suggest here for a moment. If we adopted an approach where students were encouraged to debate the veracity of everything the teacher or the learning materials brought up, regardless of the veracity of any alternative idea or challenge, students would simply never graduate. In fact, they'd never get out of history class and, well, good luck with religious studies. But Comfort & Co are not suggesting this is a sensible approach in all subjects. No, tellingly, only evolution is singled out for this treatment. It is precisely for practical reasons that students, regardless of the subject, are taught the facts already established by research conducted by those with the experience, training, materials and technology to do so. Much of this research has taken decades and thousands of man-hours with peer review and revision along the way. There is an intrinsic element of trust that what students are taught are the best conclusions rigorously arrived at by these methods and this is what education authorities and school boards are there to ensure. What makes this quote laughable, apart from the sheer impracticalities of its contents, is that these are the words of John T. Scopes high school baseball coach and occasional substitute teacher who achieved notoriety for his part in the Scopes Monkey Trial, which was itself a publicity stunt led by businessmen in Dayton, Tennessee during a dark time in American history when the teaching of evolution was outlawed in some states. Scopes even admitted later that he hadn't taught evolution. Research Ray, it's all about the research. The next quote is from a 16 page introduction to the 1956 edition of Darwin's Origin of Species as we know, there is a great divergence of opinion among biologists because the evidence is unsatisfactory and does not permit any certain conclusion. It is therefore right and proper to draw the attention of the non-scientific public to the disagreements about evolution. To show that they think this is unreasonable. This situation, where scientific men rally to the defence of a doctrine they are unable to define scientifically, much less demonstrate with scientific rigour, attempting to maintain its credit with the public by suppression of criticism and the elimination of difficulties is abnormal and unwise in science. This particular quote is a creationist favourite. Here we see firstly that this well-poisoning tactic has been used before, 53 years before Comfort thought of it. This quote and the introduction it comes from represent an argument from authority. We are told by an eminent scientist of a great divergence among biologists, yet he fails to name them. Even so, this was in 1956. By this time, it was apparent that some of Darwin's notions were wrong, and it's true that there were some notable scientists challenging what they saw as neo-Darwinian dogma. That said, the evidence in support of common descent and descent with modification, the central notions in Origin of Species, was overwhelmingly supported by fossil and molecular evidence even then. William Robinson apparently believed that life evolved, or adapted as he would no doubt have put it, he simply believed that this process was God-guided and that Charles Darwin hadn't proved his hypothesis of natural selection in his paper a hundred years before. To some extent this was true. Darwin came up with a beautifully simple explanation for what he saw but had no real hard evidence and left the job of proving his hypothesis to future generations and their discoveries. You have to ask yourself why Comfort is attacking Darwin's work of 150 years ago and quoting scientists from 1956 and the answer should be instantly apparent. Since that time, we have unravelled the structure of DNA and RNA, identified the exact mechanisms of evolutionary change, and watched natural selection and speciation in progress, both in the world and in the lab. The fact that modern comparative DNA and molecular analysis reveals a similar family tree to the one proposed by Darwin for all life on Earth is a testament to the man's reasoning abilities. If you get one take-home message from this video, it should be this. Students are not taught Darwinism. They are taught the modern theory of evolution as verified beyond any reasonable doubt by modern scientific data using modern equipment and experimentation. Only talking sense.